All right, so let's talk about breast cancer. Um, thank you, as always, for the really nice supports, the comments, everybody who signed up on the subscription page for the YouTube channel. I really, really do appreciate it. So thank you so much for that. Um, so let's talk about breast cancer. So breast cancer is just one single topic, but there's a lot to know for it. So I've dedicated this entire video to break down all of the details you need to know. And as always, I'm going to focus just on the high yield stuff that you really need to know for breast cancer. So breast cancer is the most frequently diagnosed malignancy worldwide. It's the most common cancer in the world. It surpassed lung cancer for the first time in 2020, and it accounts for over 2 million cases each year. It's also the most frequent cause of cancer death in women worldwide and the second leading cause of cancer death in women in the U.S. So breast cancer, you need to be familiar with this. There's a lot to know, the screening, risk factors, treatment, clinical manifestations. Let's go ahead and start with the risk factors for breast cancer. It's a lot of risk, a lot of risk factors for breast cancer, but we'll talk about the important ones. Let's start first with um, family history. So this is a big one. The uh, risk of breast cancer increases almost twofold if a woman had one first degree relative with breast cancer and threefold if she had two affected first degree relatives. Next is uh, increasing age. So quite simply, the older you are, the higher the risk of breast cancer. So no need to go any further into that or any deeper than to, to it than that. Um, next, uh, dense breast tissue. So women with mammographically dense breast tissue, generally defined as dense tissue comprising 75% or more of the breast, have a higher breast cancer risk compared to women of a similar age with less or no dense tissue. The reason behind this is not completely understood, but just remember, Dense, pre dense breast tissue, higher breast cancer risk. Next, hormonal factors. Um, when we're talking about hormonal risk factors, what we're mainly referring to is increased endogenous and exogenous sources of estrogen primarily and progesterone to a lesser extent. So whether a woman has higher endogenous estrogen levels or women who are taking hormone replacement therapy like combined estrogen and progesterone, any increase in these hormones can increase the risk of breast cancer. Next, this one's really important, reproductive factors, increased number of menstrual cycles. So when it comes to risk factors related to reproductive factors, what you need to be thinking of is anything that makes a woman have more menstrual cycles. The more time a woman, the more times a woman menstruates in her life, the higher the risk of breast cancer. So what exactly do menstrual cycles have to do with breast cancer? Well, going back to what we just discussed about increased exposure to estrogen as well as progesterone, during the menstrual cycle, there's a surge of both estrogen and progesterone at different stages, as we can see here. And this leads to a longer lifetime exposure to these hormones and more exposure to estrogen and progesterone due to more menstrual cycles, more risk of breast cancer. So what are some things that lead to an increased number of menstrual cycles? Well, one would be early menarche, meaning the earlier a woman starts menstruating in life, the higher the risk of breast cancer. And the later she starts, menstru and later she starts menstruating, the lower the risk. One study actually found for every one year delay in the onset of menarche, breast cancer risk was reduced by 5%. And then, of course, at the opposite end of life, at the opposite end of a woman's life, late menopause. So a later age of menopause is associated with a higher breast cancer risk. Again, same idea here. Simply put, more menstrual cycles due to menopause not occurring until later in life, higher lifetime exposure to estrogen and progesterone, higher risk of breast cancer. Next would be nulliparity. Nulliparity meaning a woman who hasn't given birth to a child. So while the relationship between nulliparity and increased risk of breast cancer isn't fully understood, one of the proposed theories is what we were just discussing, that these women don't ever have a break in that estrogen progesterone cycle. This is also why breastfeeding can actually have a protective effect and decrease the risk of breast cancer as it delays the reestablishment of the menstrual cycle. So again, may seem like a lot going on here, but the main takeaway is just more menstrual cycles, more breast cancer, less menstrual cycles, less breast cancer. And then finally, we have genetic mutations that can predispose a patient to breast cancer. And while there's a few different types, the ones that you need to know are BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. It's estimated that 5 to 10% of breast cancers are linked to inherited genetic mutations, with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations being the most common. So you need to know these. So BRCA1 and BRCA2, they've gotten such a bad name that when you hear the name BRCA1 and BRCA2, you just associate it with cancer. 
but BRCA1 and BRCA2 are actually the good guys. They're tumor suppressor genes, and it's only when these genes have mutations that we have issues. When these genes are properly functioning, they have the opposite effect. They produce proteins that help repair damaged DNA and protect you from getting certain cancers. But if you inherit a pathogenic mutation in the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene, the mutation prevent them from working properly, and that puts you at a higher risk to get breast, ovarian, as well as other types of cancers. Now, just as a little side note, there's actually four main types of cancers associated with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. Obviously, breast cancer, as we just discussed, is one. Ovarian cancer is another one. And then to a lesser extent, prostate and pancreatic cancer. It's important to know that those four are associated with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. So how can you remember that? Well, BRCA sounds very much like Barack. Baraka, Barack, and that always made me think of our past president, Barack Obama. The first letters in past president, Barack Obama, are PPBO. The PA um, in past helped me remember pancreatic. The PR in president helped me remember prostate. The B in Barack, breast, and then the O in Obama, ovarian. So again, remember Baraka, as in Baraka 1, Baraka 2 mutation, sounds like Barack. Think of our past president, Barack Obama, prostate, pancreatic, breast, and ovarian cancer. All right, so again, back on track, those are the risk factors you need to know. Now, there are, of course, other risk factors I didn't mention, smoking, alcohol use, obesity, exposure to ionizing radiation. But the one I listed above, those are the ones you really need to remember as those are often tested on. So just remember your older patient with dense breast tissue, bunch of extra estrogen, lots of menstrual cycles, and a BRCA mutation, that's what you'll need to know. Let's move on to your clinical manifestations. So generally with clinical manifestations, what you're going to be looking for, the classic presentation of a malignant breast tumor, the key terms are hard, immovable, irregular mass. So a hard, immovable, single dominant lesion with a ill-defined or irregular borders. Now, of course, these features alone cannot reliably distinguish a benign tumor from a uh, malignant tumor. Um, and also keep in mind in real life, there may not always be a palpable mass, which is why screening is important. But for the exam, those are the key terms you're looking for when they describe a malignant mass. Hard, immovable, unlike a, say a fibroadenoma that rolls all around, and irregular or ill-defined. Those are the three key terms to look out for, hard, immovable, irregular. Now in physical exam, there's a few other important things to be aware of. All depends on the type of cancer involved. So on physical exam, I want you to remember six key findings, which are all neatly packaged into this mnemonic that I made. And the mnemonic goes by the name of areola. Very fitting for the current topic, and it should help you remember the key physical exam findings to look out for in a patient with breast cancer. So areola stands for axillary lymphadenopathy, retraction, erythema, orange peel, leaking and atopic dermatitis. Let's break that down and talk about what those all mean starting with letter A, which stands for axillary lymphadenopathy. So this is very important. Anytime you do a clinical breast examination, you need to check the axillary lymph nodes. The axillary lymph nodes receive 85% of all lymphatic drainage from the breast, meaning if breast cancer is going to spread to a regional lymph node, it's likely going to be the axillary lymph nodes. So keep this in mind. Axillary lymphadenopathy is one of those key findings in locally advanced breast cancer. Next, the R stands for retraction, as in retraction or inversion of the nipple, which occurs in subareolar or central malignancies of the breast. This can also be seen in inflammatory breast cancer. So these structural changes occur beneath the breast from these malignancies, which can cause the nipple to retract into the breast. And that's what the R stands for. Remember, retraction of the nipple. Sorry, I forgot to pull that one up there. Um, next, the E stands for erythema. So skin changes like erythema, which is a reddening of the skin, can be a warning sign of locally advanced breast cancer, and more importantly, a specific subtype of breast cancer called inflammatory breast cancer, which causes this warm, red, uh, thickened breast tissue combined with edema, and it can look very much like mastitis clinically. So if you have a woman who's being treated for mastitis with antibiotics, she's not getting any better, make sure that inflammatory breast cancer is on your list of differentials. So remember, E is for erythema. Next is going to be O, and O stands for orange peel. Um, orange peel, AKA peau d'orange, which is a French term, hopefully I said that right, which means orange peel or orange skin. 
So what does that have to do with breast cancer? Well, this is a really important finding. They love to mention this in exam questions, and it's another potential finding in inflammatory breast cancer, which we just discussed. So due to erythema, thickening, and dimpling of the overlying skin and in inflammatory breast cancer, the skin can take on the appearance of an orange peel, which is what that looks like here. And that's why they call it an orange peel or peau de orange appearance. Um, just as an interesting side note, the term inflammatory breast cancer, it's actually a misnomer since there's not actually any true inflammation present. The clinical signs that suggest inflammation are not actually due to infiltration of inflammatory cells. Um, it's rather caused from the tumor cells invading the dermal lymphatics causing the so-called um, quote unquote inflammation. Anyways, that's not necessary to know for the exam, just a little bit of extra knowledge. So moving on, the L is going to stand for uh, leakage. I, uh, as in leakage of the nipple. Um, so nipple discharge or nipple leakage, the discharge can be serous, milky, bloody. Um, and although there's much more common causes of nipple discharge, like a benign papilloma, cancer should always be on the list of differentials as it's found in five to 15% of patients with pathologic nipple discharge. So remember L stands for leakage as in nipple leakage. And then the last letter, it's going to stand for atopic dermatitis, AKA eczema. Um, so let me explain this one. So do patients with breast cancer develop atopic dermatitis? No, they don't. But similar skin changes that are often mistaken for atopic dermatitis, AKA eczema, are seen in a condition called Paget's disease of the breast. It's a rare condition associated with an underlying breast malignancy. And the key physical exam findings in Paget's disease is this eczema-like eruption of the nipple and the areola. So if you see them describing this persistent scaly eczematose or ulcerated lesion involving the nipple areolar complex, very similar to the dermatologic findings in a patient with atopic dermatitis, make sure you think of Paget's disease of the breast. All right, so again, on physical exam, be looking out for areola, axillary lymphadenopathy, retraction, erythema, orange peel, leaky, and atopic dermatitis. Those are the main findings that will be on your exam question. Next, I want to quickly break down some of the most important types of breast cancer you should be familiar with, and also explain a bit of the terminology you're going to hear. So there's a few key terms. Um, that when we're talking about breast cancer, you're gonna hear a lot. That's in situ, infiltrating, ductal, lobular. So let's break this down to have a better understanding. Um, so in the breast, you have lobules and you have ducts. We can see that here, we can see the lobules here, and then we can see the ducts that are connecting right there. Um, so the lobules, they produce the milk, and the ducts, they carry the milk from the lobules to the nipple. So breast cancer can be in either one of these locations. It can be in the lobules or it can be in the duct. So it can be here or it can be here. Um, and if the cancer is in the duct, then it is called ductal carcinoma. If the cancer is in the lobule, then it's called lobular carcinoma. So that's step one, where it's located. Step two is, does it stay put or is it spreading? So if it stays put, if it's combined to the lobule, it's not escaping, it's not um, breaking through that basement membrane, then it is called in situ. Same thing with the, the ducts here. If it stays in the ducts, it's called in situ. If it actually breaches the duct or the lobule, uh, if it breaches the structure, if it breaks through the basement membrane and spreads from the duct or the lobule to the surrounding structures, this is known as infiltrating or invasive. So infiltrating lobular carcinoma or infiltrating ductal carcinoma. All right, just again, to make sure I explain this properly, if it's in the lobules, that's lobular carcinoma. If it's in the ducts, that's ductal carcinoma. If it stays put, stays in the lobules, that's going to be in situ. If it stays in the ducts, that's in situ. Um, and then if it breaches, if it breaks through the basement membrane, then it's going to be called infiltrative or invasive. Um, so those are just the general terms that you'll hear about. Let's talk about a few specific types that you're likely gonna be tested on. And we'll start with um, infiltrating ductal carcinoma. So why is infiltrating ductal carcinoma important to know? Well, this is, um, as we talked about before, this is a uh, cancer that has spread from the duct of the breast. It's breached that basement membrane. And why is it so important to know this one? And it's so important because it's the most common type of invasive breast cancer. It accounts for 70 to 80% of invasive lesions. So definitely you wanna commit this one to memory. Next, that you should be aware of, and we talked about this a little bit before, inflammatory breast cancer. So inflammatory breast cancer, um, this is an aggressive form of locally advanced breast cancer. It's a pretty rare disorder accounting for only about one to 5% of invasive breast cancers. Why should you bother knowing about a relatively rare type of breast cancer? 
Well, it has a unique presentation and anytime something is unique, it's often tested on. So patients with inflammatory breast cancer will often have this rapid onset of breast erythema, edema, along with the breast becoming warm, thickened and dimpled, which is known as peau de orange, as we talked about before, that orange skin appearance. That's the key, that orange skin appearance, as we discussed in physical exam findings, it's very important to know that. And then finally, we have uh, Paget disease of the breast, which I call Paget's disease, which I'll talk about in a second. So this is another rare one. It accounts for only one to 3% of new cases of female breast cancer, but again, unique presentation. So as we discussed before, uh, the classic appearance for Paget's disease is this scaly, itchy, eczematose, ulcerated lesion that begins on the nipple and spreads to the areola. The pathologic hallmark for this disease is the presence of malignant intraepithelial uh, intra adenocarcinoma. They're also known as Paget cells. Um, so those types of cells you'll find actually when you do the biopsy within the epidermis of the nipple. So for Paget's disease of the breast, the key is remembering that scaly, itchy eczema like uh, eczema-like eruption on the nipple and areola. That's when my mind, I changed the name from Paget's disease, Paget's disease to Page itch disease. Pa instead of Paget's disease, remember it as Page itch disease, I-T-C-H. That helps me remember this is the one associated with the itchy eczema-like rash. So again, remember instead of Paget's disease, remember it as Page itch disease. So there's many other uh, histologic types of breast cancer, medullary, tubular, uh, papillary, apocrine, secretary, um, and we'll discuss some of the receptor positive subtypes when we go over treatment, but in general for the exam, I would really suggest focusing on the ones I went over above as those are the ones that often come up in exam questions. Next, I wanted to talk about uh, screening protocols. Now, screening protocols, they vary. They vary by the medical society referencing the patient's risk factors. This is a really big, uh, it's a really big topic of discussion um, in many areas where there's really just no clear consensus from one medical organization to the next. But for the exam, there's one age bracket that's widely agreed upon, and that's what you need to remember, which I'll go over in a second. So let's break down each of the age brackets and discuss when you screen with mammography and when you don't. And this is going to be for patients at average risk of breast cancer. So starting in women under 40 with average risk, screening mammography is not recommended. So no screening guidelines currently recommend routine screening for average risk women who are under 40 years of age. So I wouldn't even worry about this one. Next is going to be women 40 to 49 years old. So the name of the game for this age bracket is shared decision making between the provider and the patient. It's going to be individualized for each patient. There's no clear consensus in this age bracket between the medical societies as the net benefit of breast cancer screening is less clear for women in their 40s. Some societies say yes, others say no. So in this age bracket, the general approach is discuss it with your patient, individualize the decision based on the benefits and harms of screening and their personal values and preferences. So overall, I wouldn't worry too much about this one. The next one though, this is the one that you need to know. So 50 to 74 years old, mammography every one to two years. This is the age bracket that almost all organizations agree upon. A woman that has an average risk of breast cancer between the ages of 50 to 74 years should be screened with mammography every one to two years. This is consistent with major, most major US and international medical group recommendations, including the US Preventative Services Task Force. So this is the one you need to know. The other age brackets, it's just gonna be individualized decisions based on risk factors, et cetera. Um, but for the exam, Remember, 50 to 74 years, mammography every one to two years. That's the high yield screening info you need to know. Let's move on to diagnosis next and your diagnostic tools. So for diagnostic evaluation of suspected breast cancer, there's basically three modalities you need to be aware of, ultrasound, mammography, and biopsy. Let's talk about a bit about each and when you use them, what you're looking for. And let's start with the most important. That, of course, is mammography. So mammography is really the best modality to not only detect breast cancer at an early stage through screening, but also for this uh, diagnostic workup of patients after a tumor is detected. Mammography often detects a lesion before it's palpable by clinical breast examination, and on average, one to two years before noted by breast self-examination. So mammo is very important for you to know, and there's a few important things to commit to memory for the exam. First, this imaging modality is generally used in patients 40 years of age or older. Younger patients uh, will usually have an ultrasound rather than a mammo, at least initially, and I'll explain a bit about 
more about that when we go into that modality next. Next thing you need to know is um, when it comes to mammo uh, mammographic features suggestive of breast cancer, uh, there's a few key phrases you want to have in your head. Speculated and microcalcifications. Speculated and microcalcifications, which instead of the word microcalcifications, I used to call them small stones. It's kind of a dumb reason, but it was just easier to remember. Speculated small stones. It rhymes. They all start with an S. So let's start with speculated, as in a speculated soft tissue mass. If you see this described on mammo, very, very likely a malignancy. 90% of speculated soft tissue, tissue masses represent invasive cancer. This is the most specific, specific I'm really having, I'm really struggling here. <laughs> this is the most specific mammographic feature of malignancy. So speculated just means the mass has these little spikes or projections coming out from it. Um, and you can kind of see that here, these little spikes that are coming off the actual soft tissue mass. You can see that here and here. So that's all speculated means, just kind of like spiky. So if you see speculated soft tissue mass on an exam question, it's cancer. Second, small stones, aka microcalcifications. These microcalcifications actually represent necrotic cells in the center of a uh, cluster of tumor cells. So remember on MAMO, if you see a speculated, uh, if you see speculated and small stones, aka microcalcifications on MAMO, it's very, very likely a malignancy. So just keep repeating that in your head, speculated small stones, speculated small stones. And then the last thing I think you should know for MAMO is your BIRAD score. So all mammograms are read by a um, radiologist and um, your you're, uh, they're assigned a BIRAD score. And BIRAD stands for Breast Imaging Reporting and Data System. And it's not only used in MAMO, but also in ultrasound and even MRI of the breast to determine the relative likelihood of a malignant diagnosis based on the imaging findings. So the radiologist assigns a BIRAD score anywhere from one to five, technically zero to six, but I'll go over that in a minute. Um, and the higher the number, the higher the chance of cancer. The BIRAD score also helps determine how soon the patient should follow up. So let's break this down starting at BIRAD 1 and 2. So if you get a BIRAD score of 1 to 2, the chance of malignancy is essentially 0%. And this patient would follow up annually as per current screening guidelines. So BIRAD 1 and 2, what I want you to remember, just remember this is not cancer. See you next year, aka your regular annual or biannual screening. BIRAD 3. Um, so BIRAD 3 means this is most likely benign. Likelihood of malignancy is less than 2%, but there were some areas that were a little sus. So focal asymmetry, a group of round calcifications. So these patients, instead of the regular one to two year screening, generally you'll see these patients back in six months for repeat imaging. So BIRAD 3, see you in six. And then finally, uh, we have BIRAD 4 and 5. You're getting a biopsy at this, uh, at this level. So BIRAD 4 is actually broken down into subcategories A, B, and C, depending on the likelihood of malignancy. Don't memorize that though. Just remember BIRAD 4 and 5 biopsy in most cases. And for those of you who like to get technical, there is actually a BIRAD 0 and BIRAD 6, like I talked about before, but you don't need to know those. BIRAD 0 just means it was inconclusive and needs further imaging. Uh, maybe there were suboptimal images or improper positioning. And then BIRAD 6 just means the mass was already biopsied and proven to be malignant. So again, remember BIRAD 1 and 2, not cancer. See you next year. BIRAD 3, little sus, see you in 6. BIRAD 4 and 5, biopsy. All right, moving on to ultrasound. So next diagnostic tool is going to be ultrasound. The most important thing to know for ultrasound is it's the imaging modality of choice in women under 30. So why do we use ultrasound in women under 30 and not mammography? There's a couple reasons for this. First, most breast lesions in young women are not visualized on mammography because the density of the breast tissue in young women limits the sensitivity of mammo. And then the second reason is there's an increased radiation risk with mammography, so it's best to avoid any radiation exposure in young patients if possible. Um, ultrasound is also useful as an adjunct to mammo to give more detail about the mass. It can also help differentiate between solid and cystic masses. It can be used to assess axillary lymph nodes, as well as provide guidance for interventional procedures like a biopsy. Main takeaway here though, breast mass in patients under 30, your initial imaging will be ultrasound. So you might be thinking to yourself, you said mammo 40 and older, 
ultrasound under 30 what about women in their 30s in that in between age range uh, what about them so that's one of those gray areas where there's not a specific guideline in general either ultrasound or mammo can be used in the sage group um, up-to-date states it's reasonable to start with ultrasound as the Im uh, initial imaging modality but with a low threshold for using mammo if there's any clinical suspicion or very high clinical suspicion so that's ultrasound there are some other imaging modalities mri which can be utilized for preoperative evaluation there's also functional breast imaging techniques like positron emission mammography. These aren't used that often. I don't think you need to know them for the, your exam. Just be aware they exist. Um, let's talk about your last diagnostic tool, which is going to be your biopsies. So who is going to get a biopsy? Well, any patient that has a suspicious, uh, suspicious mammographic abnormality. Remember, this would be your BIRAD 4 and 5 patients, or even a patient that has a very clinically suspicious palpable mass they need to have a biopsy done so let's talk about the different types of biopsies starting with your fine needle aspiration so a fine needle aspiration or fna it's a quick minimally invasive small needle is going to be placed in the mass under ultrasound guidance which we can take a look at what that looks like here so that's the pros it's quick it's minimally invasive um, you get the results back very quick but what are the cons well there's actually a high rate of false negatives it can't distinguish between in situ and invasive cancer remember the difference between those one that spread one that didn't and then oftentimes due to the small tissue sample that it's obtained with an fna you can't always check for receptor status your estrogen progesterone and her2 receptors which i'll go over in more detail when we talk about treatment so fna it's quick and easy but it can't always provide all of the necessary details and it has a higher rate of false negatives so it's not the best test the better test and the preferred initial biopsy is going to be with a core needle biopsy so a core needle biopsy is generally preferred as the initial biopsy procedure it's a bit more invasive compared to an fna as you're using a larger needle um, an fna usually uses a 23 to 27 gauge needle and a core needle biopsy uses a 9 to 14 gauge in addition it also requires a small incision to allow entry of that larger needle we can take a look and just get a general idea of what that looks like here but this larger needle increases the amount of tissue obtained and allows for some improvements over an fna first it's more sensitive um, at detecting a malignancy a core needle biopsy has an 87 percent sensitivity compared to an fna only at 74 percent this larger sample also allows for more reliable determination of hormone receptor levels like your estrogen progesterone and her2 receptors and then finally it has the ability the fna did not to distinguish between in situ lesions and invasive carcinoma so uh, core needle biopsy it's a bit more invasive but it's more sensitive allows for receptor testing and it can distinguish between in situ and invasive cancer and for those reasons remember it's generally the initial biopsy of choice and then finally we have a surgical or open biopsy this is clearly the most invasive of all the procedures and most of the time it's not going to be your initial method of diagnosis uh, it's been it's performed in fewer than 10 percent of cases usually this is going to be performed when a needle biopsy like with fna or core needle it just isn't feasible for whatever reason or if the core needle biopsy results were inconclusive all right so that is diagnosis it's a lot to know but the high yield takeaways let's talk about that really quick so remember mammo women 40 and older look for your speculated small stones aka microcalcifications ultrasound under 30 or as an adjunct to mammo for more info for biopsy fna is quick and easy but lacking in detail core needle biopsy is your preferred method it gives you the most bang for your buck distinguishing between in situ and invasive cancer as well as providing info on receptor status finally surgical biopsy only if all else fails and that is diagnosis let's move on to the last section and talk about some of the treatment options for breast cancer now the treatment for breast cancer it's complex it's highly individualized there are so many factors to consider including age tnm stage tumor type hormone receptor status risk of recurrence it can be super overwhelming you don't need to know all of the details for the exam you just need to know the basics uh, so let's break down each of the treatment options focusing on just uh, the need to know stuff let's start with your surgical options starting with breast conserving therapy um, which is going to be your lumpectomy plus uh, radiation um, and as well as a sentinel node, sentinel node biopsy so breast conserving therapy which is performed with a lumpectomy is an alternative to mastectomy for certain patients with early stage breast cancer 
This is not appropriate for all patients, patients with inflammatory breast cancer, patients with diffuse malignant microcalcifications, as well as a number of other contraindications. But if a patient is able to have a lumpectomy, a lumpectomy can remove the tumor, but not the breast itself. So the breast is conserved, which obviously is ideal. A um, couple of things to know. First, in most patients who have a lumpectomy, it will need to be followed by radiation therapy. This is to eradicate any microscopic residual disease. And then the second thing, these patients will always require evaluation of the axillary lymph nodes if they have a clinical if they have a clinically negative axillary examination, you can do something known as a sentinel node biopsy. Uh, sentinel node biopsy helps guide the surgeon to know which lymph nodes need to be biopsied. Um, so the way this works is the surgeon injects contrast near the tumor. They watch for the contrast to get absorbed by the surrounding lymph nodes. And whichever lymph nodes absorb the contrast first, those are the lymph nodes that the cancer would be like first, uh, likely to spread to first. So those are the ones that are sent out to pathology. Uh, so lumpectomy, remember, this is an option for patients with early stage breast cancer. Tumor can be removed without removing the breast. Usually, almost most cases needs to be followed by radiation and evaluation of the axillary lymph nodes. Lex, uh, next, let's talk about uh, mastectomy. So mastectomy is a complete removal of the tissue of the breast. As we discussed before, not all patients can have a lumpectomy. So patients who have inflammatory breast cancer, diffuse malignant microcalcifications, multicentric disease with two or more primary tumors, prior radiation of the breast, don't memorize those. Uh, but these patients, they can't have a lump lumpectomy and they're gonna require a complete removal of the breast, a mastectomy. Um, it's also in many cases decided by patient preference to have a mastectomy. Some women prefer to avoid uh, future post-operative radiation as required uh, with lumpectomy, or maybe they want to avoid further screening and biopsies. Some women are at a higher risk due to genetic mutations. They may just prefer to have a mastectomy. Um, so a number of reasons why a woman may have a mastectomy rather than a lumpectomy. Um, and then finally, just as in lumpectomy, patients with mastectomy also need to have evaluation of the axillary lymph nodes. All right, and let's, let's uh, talk about radiation really quickly next. It's not a lot to know here. Uh, there's many reasons a woman might require radiation. Um, of course, as we discussed before, most women who have a lumpectomy, the breast conserving therapy will require radiation to eradicate any tumor deposits remaining. Um, and patients with a mastectomy, only patients that have a high risk for local uh, recurrence will require radiation therapy. So most patients with a lumpectomy need radiation, whereas uh, mastectomy, not as common, only specific high risk patients. All right, so next part of treatment becomes a little bit uh, more complicated, but I'm gonna to try to simpl uh, simplify this as best I can. So with breast cancer, there's something known as positive receptors uh, or receptor positive breast cancer. So some patients with breast cancer, they can have these positive receptors that can be influenced by certain hormones and proteins that can cause the cancers to grow and spread. And knowing which receptors are positive is really important because there's specific uh, targeted treatments depending on which receptor is positive or negative. So again, positive receptors, they're just like this little on switch for the tumor to make it grow. There's basically three subgroups to know. Uh, patients with positive estrogen or progesterone receptors, they're called hormone receptor positive. Patients with positive HER2 receptors, aka human epidermal growth factor. And then finally, the last subgroup, patients who are negative for all of them, so negative for estrogen, progesterone, and HER2, which is called being triple negative. And of course, you can have any variation of the above, positive for all three, negative for all three, positive for just one, not the others, and, and so on and so on. Um, so let's first talk about hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So let me move this out of the way here. Um, so hormone, repo, uh, hormone receptor positive means the breast cancer cells have either estrogen or progesterone receptors, maybe just one or maybe both. Um, these patients are actually in a more favorable position because this type of cancer in some cases can be treated with alternatives to chemotherapy. And obviously if we can avoid chemo, that's ideal. So what options do we have in this type of cancer? Well, since these positive receptors allow estrogen and progesterone to promote the growth of cancer cells, the goal is obviously to block these hormones. And since estrogen plays a more significant role in the growth and development of breast cancer cells compared to progesterone, most of the time what we wind up doing is attempting to either deplete estrogen production or block it altogether. There's a number of ways to do this and don't memorize all of them, but aim to just have a general understanding of what we're doing here. So let's start with the 
estrogen blocking. Uh, let's start with blocking estrogen receptors. So that's going to be tamoxifen. So tamoxifen as well as raloxifen, they're selective estrogen receptor modulators and they're also known as SERMs, S-E-R-M. Uh, they work by blocking those estrogen receptors in the breast and that prevents estrogen from binding and stimulating the growth of cancer cells. So that's one option. The next is uh, your aromatase inhibitors like anastrozole, letrozole. These are mainly utilized in postmenopausal women and they work by blocking the enzyme aromatase. And if you're not familiar with aromatase, its job in the body is to convert androgens like testosterone into estrogen. So by blocking aromatase, we in turn uh, decrease estrogen in the body. And then finally, we have your targeted agents. Um, like abemaciclib, <laughs> these are very difficult to say. Um, not even gonna bother trying to say the other ones. So these are, the abemaciclib is a CDK46 inhibitor. I would not memorize these, but just recognize that these meds are often combined with the agents we discussed above as they enhance the benefit of those other estrogen regulating medications. So that is your hormone receptor positive breast cancer treatment. It's a lot. Basically, I want you just to focus on shutting down or blocking estrogen with those meds like tamoxifen and anastrozole, and then combining them with your difficult to say uh, targeted agents. So next, let's talk about patients with HER2 positive receptors. How do we treat those patients? Well, from an exam uh, standpoint, it's actually much easier. It's basically one med that you need to know. So HER2 positive breast cancer. This occurs when breast cancer cells have a higher than normal level of something known as HER2, human epidermal growth factor receptor 2. Um, so normally this HER2 protein helps breast cancers, uh, I'm sorry, breast cells grow, divide, and repair themselves, which is obviously no big deal. That's what the body should be doing. But in this case, something goes wrong with a gene that controls the HER2 protein, and you have this overexpression of HER2. And this can obviously lead to the breast cells growing and dividing uncontrollably. So how do we treat this? Well, in this case, we have a specific targeted therapy, and this is with something known as trastuzumab. Um, so this is the treatment you need to know for HER2 positive breast cancer. This is usually going to be combined with chemo as this is a more aggressive form of breast cancer. It may also be combined with another targeted therapy called pertuzumab. But for the exam, really focus on trastuzumab because if you get a question on this, this is the med most commonly used and it's the one they will ask you about on the exam. So trastuzumab is a type of targeted therapy and it works by targeting and binding to the HER2 protein on the surface of cancer cells and it prevents the cancer cells from receiving signals to grow and divide. So for HER2, you need to know trastuzumab. And you remember that because HER2 has a two in it and so does trastuzumab. Um, so remember, HER2 has a two on it, so does trastuzumab, trastuzumab. So if you get an exam question and they say the patient is HER2 positive, which med are you going to give them? Look for the med with a two in it. HER2 positive gets trastuzumab, two gets two. So again, for HER2 positive, just remember trastuzumab, all right, I think I drilled that one home. <laughs> and then finally, we have um, chemotherapy. So with chemotherapy, you'll hear the terms adjuvant chemotherapy and neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Those terms, uh, neoadjuvant chemo just means it's given prior to the main intervention, which is usually surgery to improve the outcome, shrink the tumor size. And then adjuvant chemo is just chemo that's given after surgery to lower the risk of recurrence by eradicating any microscopic foci of cancer cells remaining. So a number of reasons why chemo will be utilized. Patients at high risk of recurrence, cancer that's spread to the lymph nodes or other parts of the body, um, cancer that's metastasized, patients with positive HER2 status, patients with triple negative breast cancer and a tumor size over 0.5 centimeters. Definitely nothing I'd advise memorizing or wasting more than a couple minutes on for the exam. Just be aware it's another treatment option utilized for breast cancer. All right, so that is treatment. It is a lot to know. Um, let's do a triple distilled 30 second recap, starting with lumpectomy. Lumpectomy is a breast conserving therapy, removes the tumor, but not the breast. If a patient had something bad like inflammatory breast cancer, prior radiation of the breast, diffuse malignant microcalcifications, you gotta do a mastectomy, which is a complete removal of the breast. Next, radiation. Most patients with lumpectomy will get this compared to only high risk mastectomy patients. If they're hormone positive, stop or block the estrogen, tamoxifen, and letrozole plus targeted agents. If they're HER2 positive, hit them with trastuzumab. Treat two with two. And then finally, chemo for your high-risk patients, cancer, 
that has spread. Um, that is treatment and that is breast cancer. Let's do five quick questions to wrap it up. Starting with question one, a 52 year old woman presents to her primary care physician complaining of a new lump in her breast. Mammography confirms the presence of a two centimeter spiculated mass and biopsy confirms HER2 positive breast cancer. Which therapy listed below, which would be most appropriate to treat her HER2 positive breast cancer? So I'll give you a second to think about that. Remember HER2 positive breast cancer, look for the one with a two in it. So that's going to be trastuzumab. So remember with HER2 positive breast cancer, look for the medication with a two in it. HER2 is treated with trastuzumab, the targeted therapy that binds to the HER2 protein and stops the cancer cells from growing and dividing. Let's talk about why it's not the other options. Answers A and C are um, used in hormone receptor positive breast cancer as we went over before, targeting your estrogen. Tamoxifen is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Letrozole is an aromatase inhibitor. And then finally, answer D, infliximab. That's a TNF inhibitor that's commonly used in ulcerative colitis, not HER2 positive breast cancer. So again, remember, HER2 positive breast cancer, look for the med with a 2 in it, trastuzumab. Question two, <laughs> um, I should have put that up there. I didn't put that, uh, the answer. Uh, but I'm sure you got that. So uh, question two, a 57-year-old woman presents for a routine mammogram. The mammogram reveals a suspicious lump in her breast classified as a BIRADS4, and a biopsy confirms that it is malignant. Her doctor explains that the type of cancer found is the most common form of invasive breast cancer, accounting for 80% of all invasive breast cancer cases. What type of cancer does this patient likely have? So that is going to be... Uh, infiltrating ductal carcinoma. So infiltrating or invasive ductal carcinoma, it's the most common type of invasive breast cancer, accounting for 70 to 80% of invasive lesions. Question three, a 51 year old woman presents to the office today complaining of itching, redness and flaking skin on and around her right nipple. The condition was initially diagnosed as eczema, but she found little to no improvement with the topical corticosteroids prescribed by her PCP. A biopsy is performed, which confirms the diagnosis of a rare form of breast cancer. What is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? So that is going to be Paget's disease of the breast. Remember, anytime you see a description of a scaly, raw, itchy, ulcerated lesion on the nipple and the areola, similar to the presentation of eczema, always have Paget's disease in your mind for your list of differentials. Uh, as this rare condition associated with breast cancer can cause eczema-like changes to the skin of the nipple and areola, and remember, instead of Paget's disease, instead remember it as Paget itch disease. To remember that itchy, scaly finding on the nipple. Uh, question four, 27-year-old woman notices some discomfort in her right breast and discovers a lump while performing a self-examination. She schedules an appointment with her primary care physician who conducts a physical exam and decides to order an imaging test to gather more information about the mass. Which screening test is her doctor likely to recommend? So that is going to be an ultrasound. So remember in women under 30, as the breast tissue is more dense and the fact we're trying to avoid any unnecessary radiation to the breast in this age group, ultrasound is ideal to use as the initial screening test for a breast mass. Question five, 61 year old woman was recently diagnosed with early stage breast cancer and underwent a lumpectomy to remove the primary tumor. During the procedure, a central node biopsy was performed, which was negative. After the surgery, her medical team discussed additional treatment options to reduce the risk of cancer recurrence. Which additional form of treatment will the patient likely need based on her diagnosis and the procedure she underwent? So that is going to be radiation therapy. So remember, again, most women who get a lumpectomy, aka breast conserving surgery, will require whole breast radiation to eradicate any tumor deposits remaining. This is the majority of patients. So remember, when a patient gets a lumpectomy, assume it will be combined with radiation therapy. Right, so that was breast cancer. Hopefully that was helpful. Thank you so much for watching the video. The really nice comments. Good luck in PA school. Good luck on your pants, your pantry, your EORs. And thank you again.